Um, thank you for being present. So the next 40 minutes, um, I will talk to you about school stuff and uh, how it might tell us something about a pedagogical or a possible pedagogical regime of pronunciation of the school or school education. So after a short introduction, uh, I will look at myself uh, or my research, not myself, within the broader field of school ethnographies and I will try to make clear how my research interest joins uh, a rather post-humanist stance within ethnographic research by considering school practices uh, as both social material and discursive. And then I will go into a possible regime of enunciation uh, by focusing on school things, school times and school spaces. So, I think that uh, when I say that um, the school is more than a place where humans, like pupils and teachers, come together and communicate with one another, that a school is more than that, that I think a lot of people would agree with me. The same counts when I say that it is more than a place where particular human subcultures develop and conflict with one another. Yet, when considering the majority of school ethnographies, this is how the school is often presented. Human communication and human culture seem to point at what the school is predominantly about. So as attention is almost exclusively focused on the social and symbolic dimension of schooling, the material dimension is, remains often unnoticed. And yet the school is full of objects. Pupils sit at chairs, chalk is needed to write on the blackboard, a pencil is used to copy the subject matter in a textbook, wrecked cars are disassembled, car tires are rotating on machines, and even socks come in. So although these and other objects are an inherent part of what constitutes a school, they are often neglected within ethnographic accounts of life in schools. So following various scholars like Nestor uh, Sørensen, Noel, Ruhl and McGregor, I will try to move beyond uh, what Ruhl calls the humanist bias in ethnographic research to broaden our understanding of what the school is about. So I will present a post-humanist uh, perspective which considers the school as inherently social material in order to tell something about what it is that makes the school a school about that which makes the school different from other learning environments, about its own specificity. So, since the 1970s, a considerable amount of educational ethnographic research has been conducted in schools. Hence, it seems reasonable to expect that something is revealed about what the school is about, about its specificity, and it does. Although it focuses predominantly on life in schools from the perspective of its inhabitants, only recently attempts have been made to investigate life of schools, considering both social and material elements. So, within a lot of ethnographic research, which is predominantly influenced by symbolic interactionism, the school emerges through the perspectives of pupils and teachers involved. As Hammersley points out, Attention is foremost paid to, and I quote, how participants actively make sense of their environments, construct and preserve their identities and interests, how they negotiate joint action. Willis, for example, examines the school through the eyes and words of the lads, a group of working class pupils within an inner city school. As he focuses on the construction of a counter-school culture through a guerrilla war-like resistance of these working class kids, attention is foremost paid to these kids' activities inside and outside the school and their interpretation of these activities. And throughout such ethnographic accounts, the school has come to be known as a place of human culture and communication. So, starting from a more phenomenological approach of interactionist theory, various scholars like, for example, Kelly, have tried to move beyond the experience of pupils and teachers to focus on the taken-for-granted nature of school reality and hence on the defining processes within the school itself. 
Throughout observations, tape recording, and a questionnaire in one comprehensive school, Kelly shows how teachers' perception of pupils' ability determine what is taught and learned. School tracking is then no longer an objective given. Instead, it defines what a teacher knows about pupils and therefore enhances or limits the access to academic and abstract knowledge and learning opportunities, usually to the disadvantage of non middle class pupils. So several scholars, like Kelly Ball too, emphasize the importance of school organization when considering the school. Nevertheless, the school remains a strictly human affair, as it con continues to be understood as an interpersonal process, as socially constructed. And then a considerable part of the school is left out. So as the school is predominantly considered through the interpersonal, through the local meanings and perspectives as they are constructed in face-to-face -face interaction, we can state in line with Mo that the school is primarily, primarily, primarily appears as, and I quote, a single passive object waiting to be seen from the point of seemingly endless series of perspectives, end of quote. So to move beyond this endless series of perspectives and to find a way in which the school itself can be studied an ethnography of practices is conducted as suggested by Mo. Such an ethnography does not search for local meaning, instead it is interested in the activities, events and relations through which the school occurs at a daily basis. So therefore, in order to describe and grasp the everyday events taking place within school, a post-humanist stance is adopted in which the school is considered inherently social and material. So when starting from an ethnography of practices in which both social and material elements are considered equally important, the question towards the school can be asked again. So, inspired by social material approaches and more specifically by one of them, actor network theory, school practices are considered not as solely human activities. Instead, they are considered as incessantly evolving gatherings of interdependent social material and discursive components. So, a first component, social materiality, refers to the idea that human acting is inevitably also interacting with non-humans. So, it refers to the continuous interconnection in which both human and non-human, and I quote again, elements put together are not fixed in shape do not belong to a larger pre-given list, but are constructed at least in part as they are entangled together. So, everything, both social and material elements, are then considered as emerging effects of the connection between human and non-human elements. In other words, everything is understood as performed into existence and hence as continually in the making. So both human and non-human elements their dimensions, what they are and do, all depends on the form of connections in which they are involved. Hence, a post-humanist stance within practice theory is followed as the backbone of practices does not only consist of human activities, but includes the incessant disconnection between human and non-human elements. Attention is then paid to the relation between social and material parts and the manner in which both subjects and objects emerge as they continuously interweave. A second component, the discursive component of school practices, is pointed out by Kato van Reul when they refer to the significance of speech acts as they focus on the interplay of both classroom interaction and materiality. Shatsky makes a similar plea when stating that sayings too should be taken into account when investigating practices. Sayings are then understood as a type of activity, a subset of doings that says something but that does not need to involve language. So raised hands, curious glances can all say something. Hence, sayings should be regarded as a constitutive part of school practices in the making. 
And then in line with social material approaches, the school itself is considered not as an inert entity, but as continually in the making, resulting in an always provisional assemblage, a particular order of which the particularities can be described. And today we will consider the school assemblage through its possible regime of enunciation. So, originating in semiotics, Latour initially employed the concept regime of enunciation to refer to a particular manner of speech, a specific way of arguing with a clear distinction between what is true and what is false. Hence, the emphasis is not on the content of speech, it's not on what is said, but on the tone characterizing it. So when, for example, he investigates the regime of enunciation of law and of science, Latour is not interested in speaking about law or science, but he is interested in what speaking scientifically or speaking legally is about, in the scientific way, of establishing things, of connecting an assemblage, and the elements at stake when saying occur, the things called into existence and the specific way in which this transpires. So, by analogy with music, uh, Latour is interested in the tonality of a musical score. And I quote Latour here, the key in which one must prepare to play the next part. So he is then not concerned with the exact musical notes, but with the overall key which outlines the boundaries in which music can be composed, using the right pitch, the right intervals. So and as Latour has described a political regime of enunciation, a scientific, a religious and a legal one, the question arises whether indications exist for a pedagogical regime of enunciation whether a pedagogical way of speaking and acting exists within the school. So, starting from a social material interest, and hence an attentiveness to materials within school events, the collected data points also at a specific time and a specific space enacted within gatherings of humans and non-humans. So, in the following, I will discuss through the use of empirical data uh, each element, so objects, time and space separately, after which an account will be given of the manner in which they lived together. Objects. I will give you some time to read the field note. Noticed before, this ordinary left sock steps in the limelight as it is grasped by the teacher who simultaneously states that this particular piece of garment is a sock. One sock, two socks. Only becoming present throughout and as part of this particular gathering in which the pupils, the teacher, fellow pupils, zebra, Pulling gestures and a nomination come together, the sock appears as a relational effect, a thing. Isolated from its ordinary use, as it does not appear as an object to warm feet. As such, the sock, as a thing, not as an object, relates to the notion of profane things as described by Masseline and Simons. The sock is then no longer an article of clothing, but, and I quote, Something that is detached from regular use, no longer sacred or occupied by a specific meaning. It is something, in this general, non-religious sense, that has been defiled or expropriated. So, unlike other socks, this particular left sock comes into being as a thing, as soon as it is entangled with other humans and non-humans, as it is pointed at, nominated, this is a sock, and grammatically dissected, 
one sock, two socks, a particular gathering is enacted in which the possibility emerges to get to know the sock, to study it. Rudolf speaks of epistemic configurations as, I quote, social material assemblages in which material objects are employed as epistemic objects that mediate disciplinary knowledge. So knowledge then emerges as a relational effect when various humans and non-humans intertwine and hold together. Hence, it is not the sock, not the teacher that holds the knowledge, but the specific interconnection of the sock, the pupil, his fellow pupils, the teacher, zebra, and the savings that occur within this interconnection. So when entering a card workshop at school, several dismantled cards seem to await a last ride to the junkyard. However, one card of which the essentials, wheels, doors, breaks are missing is assigned to two pupils as they are instructed to repair the clutch. So the engine of a wrecked car is removed and moved by two pupils using a tackle. After arriving at the nearest workbench, the engine is placed on it while it remains fastened to the tackle. As the pupils are asked to repair the clutch, they move up and down between the engine and their toolbox while barely speaking to each other. So as this car, and particularly this engine, is assigned to this pupil, it steps into the limelight. No longer there to await its final transportation to the junkyard, both the car and the engine become the center of attention, at least for the two pupils involved. As the tackle enables the pupils to remove the engine from the car and to explore its various elements from every possible angle, as the bench provides the engine with some stability to manipulate it, and as the toolbox brings in various necessary tools to fix the clutch, the engine emerges as a thing, within this particular social material gathering. Literally stripped from its ordinary use to drive a car, this engine comes into being as a thing, only present to provide the opportunity to exercise, or as the teacher said, to mess around until certain skills are mastered. So in both the classroom and the car workshop, the opportunity is provided to study or to exercise as things like the sock and the engine appear as a relational effect of specific social material gatherings. Then neither the sock nor the engine refer to their ability to warm feet or to drive a car. Isolated from their ordinary use, they appear only for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of exercising skills. So further elaborating on the work of Rill, we consider these social material gatherings as pedagogical configurations, in which material objects are enacted as pedagogical things, which enable the possibility to study or to exercise. So, following various scholars like uh, Nespor, McGregor and Mulcahy, time is considered a relational effect of the intermingling of humans and non-humans. The question then arises whether a specific time is enacted within the practices taking place at school. of the teacher, both social and material parts, the pupil, the chair, the teacher and the test text remain present and thereby provide the teacher and the pupil with the opportunity to get acquainted again with the knowledge and skill of performing this particular text. 
As the same social material gathering is repeatedly reassembled, a rehearsing temporality is enacted. In analogy with the dress rehearsal within theatre, repetition is considered necessary to perfect the final performance. Hence, a temporal horizon is available as the text needs to be finalized at some point, but in the meanwhile, the possibility to easily reassemble the necessary social and material elements enables the pupils involved to exercise, meaning to try and to make mistakes <coughs> until one gets it right. So a parallel time was uh, also discerned, but due to time restrictions, I will not go into that. So, in parallel with time, and following again various scholars like Kato van Reul, but also Sørensen, space is also understood as enacted throughout social material configurations. And then considerable attention has been paid to the blackboard. Sørensen especially has investigated how the blackboard is essential in establishing a particular space a relational pattern of what she calls regionality, and I quote, an arrangement of well-delimited regions separated by boundaries. But how does such an arrangement come into being? How does the blackboard succeed in it? Does it get any help? And are other humans and non-humans able to create a region as well? When considering the following field note, it seems that the teacher's desk is quite able to perform a region as well. Guided by the movements and sayings of the pupils. 
So within the car workshop, at school, pupils are assigned various cars or car components. Two pupils concentrate on a Renault, two other pupils work on the engine of a wrecked car, and one pupil is balancing a car tire on a machine. So during the lesson observed, none of the pupils leave his car or car component. Hence as gatherings are shaped around cars and machines, different regions seem to emerge in which boundaries are unrestrictedly crossed by the teacher. <coughs> While wandering through the garage, the teacher enters various regions uninvited to correct pupils, to reprimand them or to set them up. Conversely, the pupils never leave their region, which is restricted to the area around the car assigned to them. So when they have a question, they do not set out to search for the teacher. Instead, they wait near the car, silently, until the teacher notices them and enters their region. So it seems that as soon as a specific car or car component is assigned to these pupils, it seems as if a rubber band fixes them to this particular car and only gives them a limited freedom of movement around it. Only the teacher seems able to stretch this rubber band beyond their region, as he invites pupils to come over, come over to look at something, to search for missing tools. Only when the pupils are ordered to wash their hands at the end of the lesson, their rubber bands are cut and they can freely roam the garage. So, as things, time and space, too, do appear in a specific way, are there enough indications to speak of a pedagogical regime of enunciation within the school? Do they knit together in such a specific way that a pedagogical regime of enunciation can be discerned? Throughout observation, educational things were discerned as they were enacted through a specific social material assemblage. As shown, both knowledge what and skills, how, manifested themselves as a relational effect of this pedagogical configuration. And then it becomes crucial to hold the gathering and the knowledge and skills attributed to it together. But how then is this momentarily consolidation reached? And how does it relate to the school assemblage as a specific regime of enunciation? And then a last field note. So the knowledge concerned with the sonata remains alive as both humans and non-humans seem to regather again and again. When pupils discuss the movie Beethoven, several animate and inanimate objects come together. The pupils, the teacher, the movie Beethoven, the composer Beethoven, and as the sonata is thereafter played at the piano by the teacher, the existing gathering is modified but kept alive through several questions. The piano and several musical scores enter the gathering while the movie seems to appear, disappear. Subsequently, a CD containing the performance of the sonata is put on, which re-engages the pupils, the teacher, their musical scores and pencils, as the pupils are asked to indicate certain things. As the teacher plays the piano and listens to the performance, she nominates several specific characteristics of the sonata. Female team, male team. As she points ostentiously at these features, she manages to draw in all pupils, musical scores and pencils present. When new elements become entangled, the gathering is incessantly rearranged. And with each rearrangement, the opportunity to study or to exercise remains present within the established gathering. It remains present to get familiar with the sonata's specific characteristics, to be dissected until the gathering falls apart. 
hence the gathering continues to hold for the sake. Hence the gathering continues to hold for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of skills. So next to the continuous rearrangement, it seems that nominating things and often simultaneously pointing at them, this is a sock, female team, male team is an important element to reach a momentarily consolidation of the gathering at hand. This observation corresponds to Rill when he states that both teachers and pupils work incessantly to assure the long enough consolidation of the gathering at hand. It is, however, not the only element leading towards this momentarily stabilization of gatherings. As a specific school time, and a specific school space is performed, the crystallization of objects into pedagogical things is enabled and hence the opportunity is provided to study or to exercise until certain knowledge and skills are mastered. Moreover, as different regions, a teacher's region and a pupil's region are constructed, bubbles of attention seem to arise in which the opportunity emerges to engage with things at hand. As if pupils are restricted by a rubber band, they are provided with the opportunity to concentrate on their work at hand. As boundaries are set and movement is restricted, these bubbles seem capable of keeping out disturbing influences as guests only arrive within one's region or home at invitation or when entering uninvited in order to improve one's work. Simultaneously, this bubble seems to prevent the penetration of an outside commoditized time in which efficiency, effectiveness and productivity reign and which might be called characteristic for the contemporary capitalist economy. As time is money, it cannot be wasted. Inside the bubble, time seems multiplied and is repeatedly rewinded. At least the bubble seems to be... Well, not at least, at last. The bubble seems to prevent possible breakouts, as pedagogical things do no longer refer to their ordinary meaning, they seem useless out there. Inside the bubble, they emerge within a certain constellation for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of exercise. They are at the pupil's disposal to study or to exercise, while outside influences or disturb disturbances are suspended. So, in conclusion, we would like to state that indications do seem to exist which point at a pedagogical regime of denunciation within the school. And within this regime, it seems that a momentarily consolidation of the gatherings at hand is reached through the construction of pedagogical things, a specific school time and a specific school space through which bubbles of attention might emerge. So, when further exploring the pedagogical regime of enunciation within the school, sayings should be registered as they are literally uttered. As they enable the enactment of pedagogical things, school time and school space, their registration is of paramount importance to further describe the specificity of the school through its regime. Now, more than an analysis of the materiality of school education and or classroom discourse, an analysis of the enunciation regime provides a manner to establish a more differentiated portrait of the specificity of the school. Through the comparison of seeming overlapping regimes and the interference of different regimes of enunciation, contrast can be identified at the intersection of those regimes, and by highlighting these contrasts, the specificity of each regime can be identified more profoundly. Similar but unequal practices might overlap, but the elements at stake, things called into existence, might remain different. Musical notes might overlap in various compositions, but their musical key might be different. And to provide a profound and differentiated portrait of the specificity of the school, overlapping areas and everyday practices should be examined. Possible, possible comparisons are then, for example, um, the school restaurant, where pupils learn to wait, and a private restaurant, a, a car workshop at school, and a private one, a school and a sport club or youth movement, as they are today increasingly described as learning environments, 
And in addition to the comparison of school practices with similar but not equal practices, the pedagogical regime can be contrasted with the political or the scientific regime. And the question then arises whether the pedagogical way of speaking and acting stands independent or is considered an application of the political or scientific way of speaking. Thank you. Education, I think. Mm -hmm. You didn't say anything about uh, how you do the observations. Do you yeah. follow some rules? Uh, so uh, uh, it, it seems to me that you're only uh, observing the interaction be be between the teacher and the group, so you never show interaction between one pupil and the teacher. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, but uh, the data, the field notes I showed here uh, are from a pilot study I conducted in uh, between November 2012 and February 2013. And this pilot study was really set up to, um, for me, I think for two reasons, for three reasons, to get familiar again with the secondary school and with its various uh, practices, because I went to... Uh, Ocam class, a class especially for newcomers, for immigrant newcomers. Uh, I went to a center for growth its own ways, a center for part-time education. So I had really several uh, secondary school variations. Um, that was the first reason, so to get to know the diversity again, to uh, get to know some uh, concept I was getting to know, so social materiality, time, space, mm -hmm. uh, and a third reason was to um, try some methodological roots. Mm -hmm. um, so here, uh, these data, I had a, a protocol. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I didn't say that. Um, in which I looked particularly at objects and how they seem to um, have the ability to gather elements around them. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why uh, my data have. But I also have data in which there is one pupil and one mm -hmm. teacher uh, interacting with one another, but I didn't include them here. So I don't know. And for the time now, because you are referring to the importance, but I think also the difficulty to uh, to uh, describe, observe the saying, mm -hmm. yeah, manifestation of the saying. Yes, so um, that is uh, something I didn't do within my pilot study. So because I was focused on objects, mm -hmm. I didn't register sayings. Um, but uh, I think after a couple of observations, it became quite clear that they are important. Mm -hmm. uh, so now uh, I'm doing my empirical field work now, and now I have two what I call entry points, and one of them is again objects, and the other one is sayings. And then um, I try to uh, register mm -hmm. them. Um, but I think there's more to that than only register what is said, because when uh, uh, that is what Latour says too, the regime of enunciation does not focus so much on what is said, but on the manner in which things are said, and that is still a difficulty to, to go around or to, to deal with. But I guess the longer I stay in one school, the more I... I have the feeling that I'm getting there. Do you think your observations are independent of the kind of school in which you observe? I mean, you have Catholic schools, you have public schools, you have uh, whether they, different whether types of schools. Yeah, I, I, I don't know whether the, the ideological context of that school plays a role in the observations that you make. Here, in the practice. Here, or? It's just, uh, can you, the things that you said now about mm -hmm. the schools that you observed, mm -hmm. 
do you think you will be able to find those things also in, in other times of schools? But do you then mean only the difference between a Catholic school and a public school? For example. Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so these are universals. Yes, that's. That's his question. You will find them in any educational environment. Not in any educational environment, I think, and that is something I, I. That is also, I think, at stake with my research that I try to investigate the school, the secondary school, and not, for example, an online learning environment, not, for example, um, modulaire openness, modular um, education. So, but then if you say, uh, I don't know, uh, a Catholic school versus uh, in a public school, I do think that I will find, I can find similar things. Sorry, so when, when you talk about, when you, when you talk about the pedagogical regime of enunciation, it actually only points to secondary education. Um, yes. Because you said that you yeah. do not consider um, online learning platforms. So just, just to make things clear that when you talk about pedagogical mm -hmm. regime of enunciation, it would be those Secondary that school. that um, depict the yeah the material and uh, sorry the material non material interaction of all object time and space and the people. In the because I think that within an online learning environment, for example, or within uh, modular uh, education or within the university, which is then something that other things are at stake yeah. and that other things might... I think it might be called pedagogical regime of enunciation too, but then I think you should... Um, because mm -hmm. Philippe is also working on the concept of regime of enunciation within the family, yeah. and then I think that other things are at stake mm -hmm. there. But can we call it pedagogical or not? I think we can, but then we should differentiate between the contexts. Can you elaborate still a little bit more on this notion of cities? <laughs> <laughs> Because you, you see that some of the media did not understand it well, but it's so to say at some point that also the gestures, that in a certain way, certain movements would be seen. Is that correct? Yes, that I, I, I do say that. I do. I also know because at my commission there was this remark too, and I have this book lying on my desk, which is still not. That the, yeah, for the moment, uh, <laughs> I think it's also a moment. She's looking to us with the But I do know it's something I have to uh, make clear, because uh, now, it's correct, as I say it, now sayings is um, the sayings, the utterances, mm -hmm. uh, but also the gestures, the pointing, the, uh, which happens a lot in schools. And then I know at my commission there was a discussion or the remark from, from you also that gestures cannot be the same or that I should. I think about that. Yeah. But I, yeah, I even had to return. Yeah, maybe it was Latour himself, you see, because I don't know that so very well this, about this regime of initiation. Mm -hmm. Is he using sayings in that way? Is it, uh, so is that a saying? The, the point in the and also, are, are, for example, if a student starts yawning, like heavily yawning, is that because you said a gesture? Because I, 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 I am also trying to understand what you mean by. Um, by saying it's not so clear mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. head yet. <laughs> for, 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 it, I can relate it also to the, the example of the motor and the sock. I think. But but in, in comparison to <laughs> yes, but in comparison to saying those are 
those are clearer, no? I mean, you can, they're, they're easily categorized, cate yeah, you can easily categorize them, but with sins, and what can you easily categorize? Sorry, when, when you talk about socks and okay, the material yeah. aspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, as opposed to mm -hmm. sins, which I'm still trying to. Yeah, as I, um, sorry, can I say something? <laughs> because it seems like with sayings and you include gestures, or you also including expressions, but if, if it seems to me that everything is included, like everything is, uh, can be understood as a saying. Exactly. Are yelling to the children or, or to the pupils and, and that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, but that's yeah. that sometimes there is an experience that, that, that there is a way of yes. talking that it's that it's somehow yes a little bit strange in a school. What do you do then? But I don't think that my research starts from. Um, uh, a predefined conception no, no, of no. And I went, I'm now, I was now, I think, for two weeks in school full time, and I had some lessons where things didn't go as in other lessons, but as I'm focused on objects, and that's not what I'm interested in. But, but the you want to have the initiation uh, regime. The regime of initiation, okay. but still the regime of initiation, because you had. Um, the making of law, you had uh, so the regime of initiation of law, regime of initiation of uh, religion and of science, and there but is no difference between doing good science or doing bad science. I think by staying in a school long enough. Yeah, but that you also don't have the experience between teachers in your research. No, yeah, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> not, not I <laughs> no, but I just I for for me the the example of the tone of music is very um, helpful to try to understand. I mean, that's how I try to understand also these sayings. Isn't this? Wouldn't it be helpful, for example, to think of certain sayings of teachers? Which are said also in other contexts, which which mm -hmm. work in school in a specific way. Mm -hmm. So I yeah I, I cannot make up one. I was thinking of, but I think such examples can uh, can show. And then I when when I now consider what I would call good or bad teachers. But I don't think it was as good as what one of the good words I used, but yes. Could you raise the question of the universal or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether you are making a study or an ethnography, I think. Mm -hmm. are, you, uh, okay. are you making an ethnography of one particular mm -hmm. place or are you making a <coughs> case study of and trying to say something about the school? school. And what is what is Luke making? Is it a case study? Or Let's not? ask her. Let's ask her. Is it here? Is it here now, too? Is it a case study or? No, it is an ethnography. But now I realize that then my answer to the question of Peter mm -hmm. might not have been very ethnographical. Uh, very ethnographical. Aha. The things that come close you can expect and you can still expect. No? Similarities? Yes. 
It's a saying. Steve wants to say something. Yeah, Steve. Steve wants to say something. Yeah, Steve. There's something that, that occurred to me that hasn't occurred to me before. Uh, now we're in the They always say anything. Uh, no, it's, it's the language you yourself use to convey your understanding. So the language you yourself use to make clear what you have observed and express. And here's a couple of examples. You speak of crystallization of objects into pedagogical things. You also speak of consolidation. You speak of bubbles of attention. And you, at some point you said, as if students are restricted by a rubber band. Now, consolidation, crystallization, bubbles, rubber band, this is all very material language. And it's language of physics. Now, in a sense, you could say, to me, this, this is expressive to me for a longing for purity or something. A bubble is a perfect sphere. Crystallization is a process, my physics is not that clear. And, 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 and crystallization is a process that only can occur under very specific yeah. conditions. Yeah. If the conditions are not perfect, you won't have crystallization. But the language you use says something very, very specific about, I think, your aims, which you might not. I mean, this is no psychoanalysis. Like <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it. It feels like it. No, but the language you use, I think, is interesting. It's really, I mean, it, I didn't notice that the crystallization, consolidation, bubbles, rubber band, your language, and it's metaphorically used, of course, you're not using crystallization in the physical sense, and it's a met but I'm not sure. Is it, I'm not sure. Is it, it? it metaphorically used? Oh, okay. And what is it? It would be up in this process, no? Mm -hmm. This language. I don't have to discuss it already. Okay, sorry. But is it metaphorically used? I, I think some of them are, some of them aren't. The rubber band, for me at this, this point, is quite metaphorically. Um, crystallization, that's a, a difficult one for me. Because I'm also still working on it, and I think it's going from metaphorically to, to not. To, to being a physical thing, but it's difficult. So when I, I write, I find it really difficult to find the right words to express what I'm trying to say. And then I don't know whether the psychoanalysis... <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know whether it was something unconsciousness. Yeah, it was unconscious, but I don't know. What to do with it. So whether because when you started to use the notion bubbles of attention mm -hmm. in relation to that, you started to talk about consolidation, pressure, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. Okay, it's it's kind of thinking in terms of analogy, but at the same time trying mm -hmm. to find a language mm -hmm. which does justice to so it, it was a bit Yeah, but it, it is example for example bubbles really started as something to try, as something metaphorically, to just try to describe on paper what I see. And then, especially for crystallization, there seems to be something more than just metaphorically that I... Yeah, I was thinking about it all day, but I just don't find the words to express what is happening there, according to me. So, Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I'm not sure how to formulate this question, but uh, do you think there is a danger of you uh, for not observing what happens, but observing what you would like to see happen in the school? And if so, do you have taken any measures in order to evade or uh, get rid of that, that danger? Yeah, what is your protocol? Um, so I, I think that uh, when conducting ethnographic research throughout observation, that is a danger. 
in every research, I guess, especially in a graphic research. Um, and within my pilot study, I worked with specific protocols, like a protocol to only observe uh, objects and uh, how they gather or enable things to gather, which worked for me on the one hand, because especially the first times um, being in a secondary school, I had this experience of writing things down that I recognized from my secondary school days and things that I didn't recognize, like, oh, that didn't happen in my school. Mm -hmm. um, but by, I think by choosing those two entry points, the objects and the sayings that I have restricted, in a sense, what I want to observe, because uh, observing in classroom, uh, a lot of things happen, so mm -hmm. you have to restrict in one way or another what you want to observe. Um, and then, do I have a protocol in, in I think, two entry points or sort of, I don't know what to call it, a protocol but, or framing, and do I only observe what I want to see? But uh, I'm not sure that there, for me there, there is a kind of tension between a pure description mm -hmm. of what you see and more like normative statement, statement. Mm -hmm. and like if you describe the idea of profanation with the socks and the motor mm -hmm. and you feel that this is something that you like that this is yeah, but, but I'm not sure that how to form it but, but, yeah. but this is what, how you would like the school uh, see functioning. Uh, but this is not uh, formulated correctly. Yeah, uh, uh, the the yeah. meaning of it is, yeah. is, is there. Yeah. And then on the other hand, you have more pure descriptions, thick descriptions that you just leave leave them. Uh, and I think this has to do with with your background and everything that you have read uh, from Ahamben and and things like that. But but it's. Well, all, all the idea of profanation that you take from your promoters or something. <laughs> <laughs> or somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I, I'm not sure whether you, the other you ones sitting at the table have yeah. the same feeling, but I have the feeling that there is yeah. something... I don't know. Uh, Can I try to formulate Yes, thanks. So. You did it last time too, so... So the thing is this, how do you differentiate between pedagogical form and a non-pedagogical form? Because you look at things in the school, and you say, look at these particular things. And for you, all of these are pedagogical. So how do you know that they are not? But I don't think that Good's intention is to differentiate what is pedagogical or not. That it's not... I'm answering to you, but... <laughs> <laughs> but am I right that I, I don't know from what I understood, that is not your objective to, to differentiate what she sees in the classroom, what this is pedagogical and this is not. I think her more, her intent, why am I doing More of like trying to discover exactly what she was like, the pedagogical regime of enunciation. So what differentiates this enunciation from a scientific enunciation or a religious enunciation? So she doesn't go to observe and distinguish oh this is pedagogical and this is not. She just looks at the material and the non-material and maybe the interaction of the material and non-material. Yeah. That is that also a question maybe of your methodology and how um, like how you identify with the methodology. Because like for the for ethnography I guess you have to really be careful how you phrase things, mm -hmm. how you mm -hmm. approach things and how what kind of conclusion you draw and what kind of observations you make or can make. So make like your position, like the position of the research in terms of like um, what is knowledge, how it's how it is observable, and how you can draw conclusions from these things. Mm. But uh, let me come back to the example mm -hmm. that you gave uh, uh, of the sock. So you observe something that happens with with the sock, mm -hmm. and you assume, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how you observe that 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 sock turns from an object into a thing. Mm -hmm. is, is that so? Or is that something that you see in the thing that you observe? I mean, how, how, how can you make that statement on the basis of what you observe? That this sort of becomes a thing. It, I think it, it's just the language to describe. Also profanation is also mm -hmm. just a vocabulary to, to name this. 
So is that? I, 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 I think I mm -hmm. because I think that's also a discussion how to to go from what you see from an observation and then to this describing and to mm -hmm. to then stating something. But um, because I think it's something we discussed also whether. Uh, a description can be enough, whether uh, you should also have uh, an analyze, I don't know whether, but, and I understand where your questions are coming from, and, uh, but at the same time, I, I don't see how to avoid it or is it purely something that has to do with, with language, with the with the words I use, or is it just the, the step I take between just describing, seeing and then saying something about it? I think for me mm -hmm. just to pick it on what mm -hmm. says so it's one thing to say that this object, the mm -hmm. so or the engine, becomes the center of attention, mm -hmm. which is, let's say, a more neutral way of describing. So when pointing to something, this becomes the center of attention. Mm -hmm. But you also say that the sock and the engine is stripped from ordinary use, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. made profane. That is so yeah. but that is, you could say, the way you put it, is for me already a specific interpretation. Because I would not agree that the sock is stripped from ordinary use, or the engine. No, no, no let, the, let, let, let me use the engine as an example. Mm -hmm. The engine, you say it's stripped from ordinary use. Mm -hmm. Well, that depends. I mean, obviously, it's not used for driving, but it's used for a technician. So, for the technician, in a sense, that is ordinary use. That's what you do with an engine. Mm -hmm. So, what is ordinary use of an object? But you, you are saying it becomes an object of attention, yeah. so it stops being an object of an object of yeah. But that's the same as saying if something becomes an object of attention. It's, it's also an interpretation because you assume that it stops being an object yeah. of attention. No, okay. But I don't know what ordinary use is then. Because there, the ordinary use is always in the background as a reference point. That's with the soft. You say that the sock is, is stripped of its ordinary meaning. That's the reason why that. she, if it's her protocol, if her life mm -hmm. was looking at objects mm -hmm. in the past, yeah. and suddenly they start to talk about a sock that one minute ago was what just the below the table, and it was not, and suddenly it becomes a, the object of attention. So because something happens. No, no, okay. And so but ordinary it's not, it's refers not to use. Something happened, but. It was also something good that happened because it, in the background of your observation is this is the 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 the, uh, the voorwaarde for the leren, the need to learn what the knowledge, the uh, uh, condition for it, for for so to try to try to describe what it is. So I don't I don't think that is kind of. Uh, I don't, I don't even see the normative element, but I, I, because you say how it would like, how I, I would like school to be. I like the concept of profane object, and to be honest, it took me a lot of time to just put it in there because I don't like it. And then, maybe your voice you just changed change because you found something that fits your research topic and that was an example of it. No, it, it, I think that the, 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 the concept of profane things helps me to get clear what is happening yeah. there. Yeah. And then, yes, I like it because it, it, for me it helps me to, to describe what I have seen and what I think is happening there. And, and yes, I make certain interpretations. But then how to do ethnographic research without... But then I, I, I think I would suggest not to make use of this profanation or in order to describe what you see. There's a question more about inductive versus deductive. 
give the impression somehow that yeah. it's kind of Did you have a frame exactly. and okay. then you yes. try to illustrate that frame yeah. by and yes, I think that's, that's yeah. and then I go with so a particular the frame to school and just yeah. something different and no one okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the same. It is not the same, but it comes close, <laughs> I would say. But if you make it transparent how you approach the research, it's not and there can be a contradiction with the assumptions you made, but it's not normative. And all research is not. As soon as you start to use a concept. Mm -hmm. And she can and she can do deductive, no? Well, <laughs> that's there is nothing. I don't no, I think I think that when you mean the example between inductive and deductive, that especially in ethnographic research and research research I want to do, that I particularly don't want to go with uh, uh, concept with frameworks to the school and then because I do believe that you then only see what you mm. want to see, and that's also why I went to the school with with a restriction of protocol concerned with objects because I couldn't observe everything that is happening there. Um, and then time and space came came up, sayings came up, that wasn't something I, I was looking for. Okay, but let, let's go back to the example. Can I go back to this? I'll, I'll ask. Can I go back to the example of the sock? I'm, I'm really muzzled by what you said there. I think at some point you said, at, at that point, at a certain point, the sock stops becoming an ordinary object. But this, it's made free. I didn't say made. Well, how did you put it? That it was <laughs> profane in the office. Profane, yeah. and then how did you put it? Taken out of its ordinary meaning or use. Because what you see is that the teacher defines what it is, gives the meaning to that thing. So it's not made free of the meaning. But she but is saying this is a suck. She's not giving meaning to it. Is. She doesn't say something like but that, and that, we use then it you are to work our feet. Then you are disconnecting the word from a meaning. And that just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's it, when, when it saying this is a suck, it's saying what it means. It's especially it's it's giving the yeah. point that yeah. 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 that's yeah. yeah. No, I will, I will let, we won't go into that. But I think this is no, different too much. Yeah, but there is no distinction yeah, yeah. between the word and the concept for what it is. I mean, that I distinction just that doesn't make sense. sense. He is not saying, what is he saying? I don't know what is he saying, the meaning of it. Is he saying the meaning is sock? But the meaning is implied in, in what he says <coughs> there. I mean, this is a sock, and by showing the fact that it's around your foot and not around your head yeah. or something, yeah. it already implies a certain meaning. A sock is something that you put. Yeah, on, uh, over your foot and it's in your shoe, it's not over your shoe, it's over your foot and in the shoe. So you immediately imply meaning, meaning. with saying that word. It's not on the hand, it's not on the wall, it's on the foot. And if you don't see that with a sock, the concept of foot and shoe and, and whatever is implied, you don't know what a sock is. It doesn't just, I mean, and then you don't get it. And how can you learn that? Well, it's, that it's about learning. Yeah. But I don't think that the, 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 the example the student was, was saying, what is this? He was asking, what does that word mean? What, is this, what does that word mean? Mm. Because of our learning, right? Learning the words, yeah? And then the teacher showed the sock. So this is a sock. What is the meaning of the word sock? You say, and then so you ask for the meaning of the words, and then you, oh, this is a sock, this is a sock. Okay, oh, this is a sock. Oh, yeah, this is something around your foot. I mean, if if it's, if you don't see that it's oh, something that is put over your foot and in the shoe, yeah. well, then you're still not not there yet to understand what a sock is. Yeah. But that but that means that it's not natural that that thing is connected with that word. That's not natural. That's what it shows, right? Okay, but this is this is this is second language learning, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not this is not. I mean, this is not learning your 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 um, mother tongue. This is learning a second language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, 
mm -hmm. when you say that's not natural to connect the word to that thing. This is something I would say, yes, obviously, when you're learning your mother tongue, mm -hmm. you know, when, when little toddlers say, obviously, when they see something, they don't know what it is. But this is second language learning, this is connecting a second a, a, so, so it's, it's different. So well, I professor, so you mean that there is no professor? <laughs> no, no, no. Now my thought is Which which professor? <laughs> 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 so the, just to just to Okay. So you are saying that there is no profanation that is happening in Vietnam. As opposed, yeah, yeah, as opposed to what you said that there that um that uh yeah that there was profanation. What you are saying that no, that there is no profanation actually. Not in this example. Yeah, yeah. It's an old contrast. And with the motor? Well I could see I could see the uh, that concept groups there. Are there different levels of profanation? Because like the engine is also put together with tools, so it's still like in a way in its context. Like some, someone is putting the machine together in the way it's supposed to be. I was wondering about this toolbox, but maybe a confusing um, one. <laughs> no, so in this situation there is this car. Yeah, you can still see it's a car, but that's it. And then they have to, they get instructed to repair the clutch. And apparently the clutch, so the coupling, has, <laughs> the coupling, <laughs> the clutch, has something to do with the engine. But when you look at the car, <laughs> so, <laughs> anything about car, when I, can, so when I hear it, you have to repair the clutch. And they got the engine out. I was puzzled too. But the, the clutch isn't there anymore. So if you look in the car, <laughs> it's 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 just not there anymore. So and then your question is how the tools are connected to. You know, because um, I was just wondering, but well, maybe that's a different thing. Than, um, um, the way what when it becomes a thing actually, mm -hmm. because then it's still you have the tools and you repair the car. But maybe what can you? What else could you do with the, like with the situation? So I was just wondering when this becomes a real thing and when it's still a, like an object. And I was wondering where this boundary is, but it's maybe yeah. You know, with the idea of profanation, she 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 when look was a was a what are the words? Spokesperson. The 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 thing becomes an object. Because of that, no. yeah. ah, sorry, sorry, okay. <laughs> the other way around becomes the other way around because of uh, the idea of profit of profanation. Okay, maybe then I don't understand the, the object thing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, this one. So for me, it's it, it is the clearest within the sock example, but apparently that is not. <laughs> so you have all the socks. You have like 20 student pupils in one classroom outside. I looked it up. It was freezing. So a lot of pupils were wearing socks. And they just weren't, they weren't there until this moment that, that one pupil asked, teacher, what is a sock? That's and the same with underwear. Yeah, that's the same. The mm -hmm. underwear wasn't there until <laughs> until this pupil asked, "What is a sock?" And by going towards it, grabbing it, and pointing at it, and really saying, "This is a sock." This one sock was there, and it said something. And there, for me, the object goes. Changes becomes. Mm -hmm. I think it's. A, I think you're right. It's, it's. It's not just an example of a concept. Mm -hmm. huh? It's not just an example of a concept. It becomes this. This thing now here becomes something. But is it really? Okay. So it's not just an example. Not just an illustration of the meaning of sock. That that's mm -hmm. that I think is is what it is about. Also, it is it becomes something. There in that context, so it is not just explaining, not just taking some example of a sock. It could be any sock to that I book and show you the sock and want to learn you the sock. The sock becomes something in that very concrete gathering 
it has it it starts to work in a certain way. And then and that, I think, is at the same time, as soon as, as this is over, as the teacher walks away as students, it, it just vanishes again. It's it becomes back it goes back to the object not being there, not being noticed. But it, it could also be a painting of the sun. I mean it's not about this it could be an exercise of looking at the I mean or at the chalkboard. Drawing a sock. This is a sock. Then it would be the same. It work would work the same. No? Because an object has to be stripped off completely of its internal functionality in order to become that thing. But I think that is the question that we, we are trying to, to solve. Right? Not just functionality. No, not just, I think not the, just the claim is more, it's disconnected from what it means. Yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or do you have degrees in that process? That is what you're referring to. I'm sure whether it is relevant for you. Yeah, the I, I do. I think but it is relevant. But the question of what does mean? Yeah. yeah. Means ordinary use or ordinary meaning. Yeah. 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 The meaning of the language is the meaning of the word is in its use. Is in its use. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So because then I can imagine a case where where someone thinks so there's a picture of sock and then he goes into the Louvre and it's oh all oh, socks. Sock. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all pictures. I mean But you I mean these are second language I mean no, they reckon um, Oh okay. If well, you now, know in your mother see, language, that's mother my tongue, point. Yeah, that's but my you point. know I'm in your mother tongue yeah. what socks are. But that's my point. The entire network of meaning and use is there. Mm. Do you make sense? Mm. You're making my point. Yeah, yeah. But it's a movement. Yeah. But that's what it's not. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a movement. Discussed. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> here, this movement is important huh? from something. Um, yeah, okay. Not the mind. Below the day for that because I mean that. that it's not just the soccer as such, but mm -hmm. yeah. sorry, the movement is after the music expression. But if it's also not about meaning, then also the specific context is very important, I guess. Like, you, you go to six different schools, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, I guess in every in every school you have, like, a, probably a very different constellation of movement and meanings, maybe, maybe not, or or you have to at least like address it in a way and that you you are aware of this and that it might be like a, a like a little flaw in your research or like something you have to be aware of. That and that you go like into a very different mm -hmm. context and then in all these contexts like the meaning mm, like the meaning of what? Like the perception um the understanding of uh, a sock or the engine or Maybe that's too much. I mean, yeah. I just don't understand. Yes, yes. I just, uh, maybe I don't either. <laughs> 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 no, but I, I, so I think. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe you are because I, I, this, this, uh, this uh, observation of of the Beethoven. I recognize that because I was also you were there. in the in the music school. Eh? Mm -hmm. So. When I, was, when I went to the university, it was very strange for me because I was used to rooms with the piano. I was used to hear uh, playing music all the time when we were changing rooms. So that was part of my school. So there were very little things that were very particular to that school. And I, I, I was, yes. 
it appealed to me after going elsewhere. So I, I, I understand that, that, that for example, an, 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 uh, how to say it in English, the technical school is very different from a music school. The, the, the kind of, of, of uh, arrangements could be different. Because he referred to the regime of initiation. And to that door, and he, his interest is, is there something different than political? If you compare political actions and sayings with scientific, so in a way, your hypothesis is perhaps there is also something typical about pedagogy. Mm -hmm. That's the that's yes. yes. And you are not trying to compare technical education, no. but in a way, your assumption, and that's perhaps. The mm -hmm. is, uh, let's assume and uh, let's try to take that serious that, that hypothesis and try to find out whether that is something specific about a uh, pedagogic regime of institution. Mm -hmm. Of course, always implying partly, not totally, but partly that there is uh, that you make a comparison. Yeah. Have you have you read anything like about research and like when you because I I'm just starting with the market, so I'm really far away, but. Um, when you do ethnographic research and you do it in like different settings, because mm -hmm. the ma most like the most ethnographic research I'm familiar with is like in one specific setting, mm -hmm. and you really dive into this one thing, and then you, um, so I'm not sure if that is I'm interested too. But that's yeah. I think always the, the, the contradiction is yeah. in a way you do not want to make a comparison. Yeah. Because then you are yeah. often in a kind of case yeah. study design. Mm -hmm. yes. In a way, the assumption of ethnographic research is that you can, can describe positively the ethnic mm -hmm. without making comparisons. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption of ethnographic research. If you do justice to what you see, mm -hmm. you grasp the ethnic in, in that practice. Mm -hmm. And of course, you. Maybe that's how any research has an assumption of yeah. any research. Yeah. To the sub. Maybe that original definition of ethnography is uh, incorrect. I mean, not that you are incorrect, but the original conception of ethnography is flawed. Yeah, what is the original? What is the original? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that what Mark was yeah, just saying? To, to describe, to describe the ethnos, mm -hmm. takes, if you take seriously ethnography, yeah, grafe and ethnos, yeah. to describe the ethnos, maybe that original conception of ethnography is simply flawed. That there is no way you can describe an ethnos without automatically making comparisons. But her ethnos could be the class. I'm just, I'm just asking. I don't know. And whatever we call a class is for her ethnos. Yeah, but, but the, the problem still is the same. I mean, you can describe it. But based on what are you saying? Then? On what you just said. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, saying that's the assumption, and, and but you are saying perhaps that's wrong. Assumption. Yeah, because and you seem why? to you know you seem, no, you, you seem to me to give the, uh, the, the very what well, seems to me the very original the very original oorspronkelijk uh, oorspronkelijk definition of ethnography mm -hmm. and I'm just asking maybe that uh, from the beginning that's that's the wrong idea yeah. in my idea I mean we have this been discussing this also you listen now like like about 200 the making of law so in the first 200 pages it just mm -hmm. describes the acne of law mm -hmm. yeah. the upper supreme court uh, so each 200 pages just using trying to describe it from the inside without making comparisons mm -hmm. last 60 pages he compares law with science Mm. There you see a boat. So the first is a kind of real ethnography, but it seems as if he if that is not sufficient, mm -hmm. and he switches to a kind of comparison mm -hmm. in order to give more meaning yeah. and, to the ethnography. And, and the comparison is necessary. You think? That's that's for me yeah. the question. Is so it necessary? It, it seems as if it is necessary. Yes. So uh, that so what from what I can deduce from that would be. If Lut would really, 
if, we, if Lute would really try to get into what is a pedagogical regime of enunciation, mm -hmm. that at the end of it all, she would have to compare it with the... That's what she listed at the end of her presentation, mm -hmm. yes. That's, I think that's always a bit of question. Mm -hmm. yes. And it adds to what you were saying. Yes, I, I, I compare it with what Peter Reiske did for, for Zinneke Parade. It was also when comparing Zinneke Parade with other parents that it, it, it became more, more clear what Zinneke was about. But still, I, I I would like to believe that. It's <laughs> Without comparison. And of course, if you if you believe that, you fall back in a kind of post-positivist paradigm, of course. No, that that there is an identity without difference. That's yeah. the assumption that That's you can describe something without using differential meanings. That, that's the idea. Yeah. It's a positivity that you can describe. Um, so comparison is necessary for you? No, no, I still hope to believe that's not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, but isn't that so dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> no, but as you said, it's again the breaking back with this post-positivist. Oh, I've always had been a positivist. <gasps> you don't? Uh, See. <laughs> but you, you do compare because Philippe is, is, is one never listen, admits analyzing that. your family. One never admits that. But I'm not comparing with Philippe for now. I don't know whether we will. You just have to find the right author and ethnography. <laughs> no, but, but, but your, your descriptions are full of comparison. Crystallization, for instance. But is that a comparison? I think it's just a com like a comparison isn't dangerous. And, like it's not dangerous, but it's like critical in this in this ethnographic research paradigm if you do it between different practices. Mm. Because you're an ethnographer, you dive into like one mm -hmm. practice, and this is essential. And if you compare it to another one, that's mm -hmm. maybe critical because of yeah. Because it's not so easy to compare, you really want to focus on one thing, so there's like something that might be difficult to bridge. But it's not good comparison like in this one study. But is or the teacher has has performs the region. But how is that? Is that a description? Because when when you say that something performs something, mm -hmm. teachers are performing. Then I mean in the same discussion again, but what performs says to me, I can only understand because of how that goes back to the meaning of that word in an artistic con a context, a performance of something. <coughs> so I take that with me in my understanding of that. So but is it a description I or is it is, is it a description or? or? Is it a description yeah. or to use the dangerous word already an interpretation? So I then if it's already something that you could question in data. So if you want to describe indeed, if you if you use the notion of perform, mm -hmm. do you not include eh, mm -hmm. what you say now? Mm -hmm. A kind of analogy with the artistic with an artistic context. So maybe the word perform is not the good, not a good word, it is not the good yeah. word if you want to describe, so, so just, just as yeah. I don't know, but it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's maybe it's not just a good, good, but that does not mean that you cannot try to find the just the right word to say what it is. I have a question. <laughs> Like when you do research, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> no, because now we're talking about like describing the data. So I have like this idea that when you like like first you describe the data and then you go to interpretation. And now you're saying that like the description of the data is already interpretation. Like I like when I was told that I from my thesis that I have to like describe everything very as objectively as I can in a way, and then later interpret, refer to the theory and bring in my own interpretation. So is this then now a discussion of how she presents her 
her uh, description of the data, or is it a, a critique of how she um, makes conclusions or um, interprets. Yeah, interprets those things? I think it also has to do with, with the question, can we describe something by using language? Oh, wow. <laughs> no, but yeah. I, I mean, every, every word has a particular meaning and refers to other meanings and is yeah. used in a particular context. So if that is correct, then you cannot use any word in order to describe mm -hmm. something without immediately going and jumping into a particular kind of interpretation. So, I'm not denying that. No, no, but it's, 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 it's puzzling because what, what then can we do? Because it's not about words, not about sentences. I was wondering maybe with uh, your example of the conference table mm -hmm. uh, and the word perform, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you would just describe this table just being a wooden thing, uh, empty, I mean, that there are no students. Maybe you, you can, can you just go back? Then. So, uh, where, is, where is the sentence that says perform? No, it's not there, oh. it's not in, in the field mode, it's in my description slash interpretation. <laughs> yes, that's can you then say the sentence again, please? <laughs> Just to make sure that I understood it The sentence with perform. until corrected, the assignment, no, it's not the table, never the table which performed. But, but I guess it's right that you meant that this table then... Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. yeah. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my, my, if I understood you correctly, then you meant that this conference table is not a conference table anymore, but uh, like a private table of this mm -hmm. teacher for correcting these mm -hmm. tasks. Mm -hmm. So, and then you used to the word perform. Maybe, maybe it is said that here, maybe, I don't know, that the, if you would describe this table just being a table, a wooden or iron thing that stands there without pupils around it and just having a pencil on it or things so so that you not use the word perform but that out of the description comes it becomes clear that it is that it is empty and that it is so I'm I'm I am um, I, I I I mean the same thing that you mm -hmm. mean I think but, the, but the I understand thing. also that the word perform makes it maybe something different so if you would just describe it as it is in the state that it is and in the space that it is and in the time that it is and in the constellation but then how can i describe the thing that happens yeah. how a valid question. i do i just don't know how because for me it now seems that going from description to interpretation is quite problematic and I guess that maybe the way I do it here is not the right way, and that performing is, I, I understand what you're trying to say, but then how do I find the right words? Maybe to, to leave them, to, to keep the words very tight to the object itself. I think your access was the object, mm -hmm. but your focus was. If I write an interaction, yeah. actions, the relations, so you are describing relations. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps that makes it confusing because I, mm -hmm. you refer to 
describe something in the making. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is with anthropomorphizing the action of the paper. Because when you say a paper performs, it's somehow, or acts as you somehow anthropomorphizing it instead of just treating it as an object that is behaving as a boundary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking all the questions.